What's up, gang? It's Brian B. Miss Emily. And Benji Blue Shoes. <laughs> and his blue shirt. I didn't know the blue was the color of the day today, so I'm in a little bit of red. So this is our Q&A for our, uh, the end of our week, week six or seven of our lockdown videos. Um, so thanks for hanging out with us, guys. We'll do the State of the Union. That's sort of how I kick off some of these Q&As because uh, I know the questions are a little slow to get rolling. Ben is going to monitor the questions right here um, in the computer. Miss Megan is not here. She's spending time with family. So we're doing our thing. So the State of the Union here in Kentucky, and I'm sure we'll get into this with you guys around the country, but um, we are back to work next week. We've been in a phased reopening here in Kentucky, and... Um, they don't speak to dance studios specifically, but I kind of slotted us in with um, salons and massage parlors, um, thinking about the fact that we're working with customers in our segments throughout the day. Um, so we're opening up for private lessons as of, technically we can open on Monday, which is the holiday, so we're going to open on Tuesday and uh, start back on private lessons, and then we'll look into the, uh, you know, what will happen for group classes under 10 people currently over the next two weeks. So that is the good news. What is going on with you guys? What's going on? Where do you live? What's the the situation? Who's opening? Who's not? What phase are you in? What phase are you guys in? Um, clue us in because I've not been paying much attention. What are you excited about getting back to teaching? Teaching and seeing people. How about you, Benjamin? Having more excuses to get off the couch and not be lazy. <laughs> And not watch Netflix. As, yeah. as he was telling me, he's been doing his push-ups and I drinking haven't. a lot of water. I've been working out, too. I, lost, I have it. Cardio has not been a strength of mine. I lost six pounds this week on my diet. I went to a family thing, a family birthday party, and ate some junk. Not too bad. Not too bad, though. Not too bad. Panda Express. Yeah. So, um, and on that note, um, on that note, we will probably be stopping the live videos in this fashion. Um, I like the format quite a bit. So I'm going to brainstorm a way that we can do this with some sort of regularity. Um, and we'll communicate that via email. So I'm sure if you guys are watching this, you probably get our emails. If not, I would go ahead and get on the email list at westcoastswingonline.com. And then we can communicate. But we're going to brainstorm some ideas. I've got some, some cool ideas uh, to go on in a less grinding format. Yeah. And if you haven't seen all of the live videos we did, you can go to westcoastswingonline.com forward slash live and you can uh, watch any of the replays. So if you kind of joined us midway through all of our videos, they did get better as we went on, but there's still good information in all of them. So you can uh, check those out too. They were good. This has been a study for us because even though we're probably the numero uno like live video or video West Coast Swing people, um, the live format was different. Yeah. And we... We learned a lot about it. We screwed it up technically in the beginning, mostly me. Thank God Ben came in and helped figure us out. Um, so we've definitely gotten better. So you can take it over, Mr. Ben. What's going on in there? Ben reads better than I do, so he's going to be the voice. Joan says that she is in Orlando, and they're resuming to take private lessons next week. Very excited about that. And then Gordon says they are going into phase one next week in Singapore. Go. Gordon, Gordon, you are the rock star. There are a couple people that hung with you as like biggest Yan fans. Yan Lee, Yan Lee um, George. George hung with us. But I think uh, when it came to the final lap, you kept sprinting and you hung with us. And we appreciate you, buddy. So thank you very much for the support and all the questions and the feedback. It's been fun. What's Diane got going on? Diane's been there a lot, too. Diane on YouTube asks, just curious, how many or what is the percentage of our private lesson students that have committed to returning? That's a good question. Good question. Um, the first half. Yeah, so the, the couple different metrics that we figured out, and you guys might have heard this, might not, but our cruise. We were supposed to have a cruise that went out in July. Um, it was going to go out in July. It had 160 some odd people booked, and there were 40 some odd people that said, I'm going down with the boat, keep me booked, I don't care. So that told me that 25% of people will literally jump off of a cliff for dancing regardless. Um, so that kind of let me guess that about half of the students, and what do we figure out? Because we looked over our private lesson schedules and we kind of guesstimated at what? Uh, probably 40 to 50% of people um, we think will come back. That's kind of what we're banking on 
as far as our numbers go. Yeah, and that's, I mean, the hardcores are, the hardcores have been dying to dance. You guys are watching, you're the hardcore already if you're watching. Um, so I think those people are safe. And then what the, the other 75% that won't jump off a cliff for dancing, what percentage of them will come back? Um, I don't know, but I'm guessing that half of the regular business that we would have had coming back to the door right off the bat would be my guess. And then if I'm uh, too low or too high, we'll adjust the expectations from there. Um, but this is really the first week. Yeah, we'll see after when we open on Tuesday and um, kind of reach out to all of our students, we'll see exactly who ends up on the schedule and who needs to take a little bit more time uh, for whatever reason, whatever they are feeling like. So the second half of that is, will we be wearing masks? Yeah, very good question. And so it stinks because I'm a business owner and I have to be professional. I kind of still see myself as I do this because I do what I like to do. Um, but I have to be professional. So I actually combed over like the quote unquote legal guidelines. And Kentucky's governor, it's difficult to fetter out, right? There's not like a single source to go to. And so I found that some of the initial documentation, like the rules and regulations, actually had been removed. And the the forms that we found now on the government websites were more suggestive. So there used to be 10 rules that you have to follow if you're going to open um, in Kentucky. And those documents literally are 404 on their pages. They've been removed. And they've been updated with um, regular like uh, suggestions. And so we actually put out a document that was cobbled together from um, the ones that the government put out for um, massage therapists and uh, hairdressers. So I took those, threw them into a big spreadsheet and combed through them and kind of rewrote them for our business. And for us, most of them said like suggested, right? It was suggested to do this if it was possible. Um, so there are no rules. So I guess our tact is what? Well, we do have masks here for people that do not have masks of their own. Um, and some students, I believe, are going to request us to wear masks. Otherwise, I don't believe um, masks are they're mandatory. Not, not mandatory. So um, it's going to be completely up to our students. And we have a whole bunch of other like in and out procedures that we're going to invoke so i think that that will help the flow of things and then we also if we need to we've got a wall and a whole bunch of other stuff lots so of lots of space um so yeah it's kind of up to the student themselves yeah and my personal take if you guys have kind of followed and some of you like gordon have watched all these videos um i've been kind of non-committal in what i've said i've just kind of give my overarching thoughts and not like my personal opinions but i'm starting to kind of center in on the fact that I think we're going to have to reopen in some capacity in, in different areas, right? And there's people that are just, they need to work. They want to do what they want to do. And we're going to have to make decisions for ourselves. And so we're trying to structure it as business and how to be, um, take the temperature, not literally, because that was one of the original <laughs> guidelines. Yeah. And I was like, you're going to make dance teachers take temperatures. Um, that is now off the list. So we don't have to take people's temperatures. That was one of the first yeah. 10 rules. Um, so thankfully, cause I did not want to take temperatures. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. Um, yeah, so we've, <laughs> so we're going to try to be as, as respectful and professional and clear. And we've created some structures based upon, um, on the government guidelines and shout out to, uh, Mike Spencer mm -hmm. who put out something on one of the pages for, uh, professional dance teachers and some of their guidelines and that kind of got us going. So. We'll, we'll not congregate like we used to. Everyone congregates in the area in the corner and sits around and talks. We're going to have people wait in their cars till they come in. And we're going to roll through that for a couple of weeks and kind of take the temperature of what everyone's feeling. And, um, you know, in my opinion, if everyone comes back and says, look, man, lose the masks. We don't care. Like, we're touching hands. We're, we're going down with the ship. Then over the next couple of weeks, we might kind of just shift to that. Um, and then we'll see. It's difficult to do polka in a mask. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky. What else we got, Benjamin? Diane also wants to know, how many battery packs did we go through in the last couple of months? <laughs> All right, Diane, when we started... <laughs> we learned. I love it. <laughs> we had um, one less microphone. We had uh, $1,000 in the bank that now belongs to a lens on the camera. 
we were going through batteries pretty quickly. So now we bought a second battery for the camera and we bought an entire bank of rechargeable batteries. So we have a bank that's, Emily's got it like about this big of rechargeable batteries. Um, so that way it lets us at the top of the day just swap everything out and then we can swap out batteries all day long. Because when we shoot videos to the website, we're here for big chunks of time. Yeah, so we have a whole big, you hold it right out in the middle, bingo. There's our big battery charger. So yes, and we went through probably about 40 batteries in the first month before you bought that. But then they weren't fully charged. Yeah. They were like half charged batteries. Yeah, we, uh, the issue was we couldn't, uh, we couldn't use half charged batteries because they would shut off in the middle of a video and then we'd have to switch batteries in the middle of the video. So as soon as it went, um, the, the microphones have a thing on it that's in three pieces. As soon as it dropped a third, then we would switch the batteries out. So we went through um, about 40 two-thirds charge batteries in the first month before Brian got the rechargeable batteries, and it was a very big money saver. Idea. It was good. It's good. And this is what we do, so we're going to be doing this for a while. Yep. Um, Christy Vine. What's up, Christy? Christy's mom lives in Kentucky. Hey. And I've not seen your mom since, I think, Georgetown, where she lived. Yeah. So you should get a car, car battery. battery. That'd be hilarious. I don't think it would work. That'd be hilarious. So who's here to talk about becoming good to great as a dancer? <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Tell me on Facebook and or YouTube, please. And give me some questions and we'll get rolling and we'll give our thoughts. Um, Let's, you can read all those. You're good says um, MS. Dungan says, I have no expectation of my instructor to wear any PPE whatsoever. They just want to dance. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Actually, when we, when we talked, uh, there's, again, there's a Facebook page I made for professional country dance teachers and the discussion in there was like, are you going to wear masks? Do your student words want to wear masks? Do they want, if an event comes up, you know, let's say midsummer, there's a, a weekend event, you know, what if events got rid of social dancing, just a competition of workshops and like the overwhelming feeling, I don't know if you saw this, was like, no, we want social dancing. We want it to be as normal as possible. Um, so that's the current feeling I'm getting for the majority of people at this point. I'm curious how much of that is the country world culture and yeah. how much that varies from, I don't know, the West Coast culture. I know they'll probably be very much the same way, but the ballroom culture as well. Yeah. Ballroom dancers don't social dance. Like when yeah, you go to an event, yeah. that's I mean, not a big country would be more similar in that. Um, oh, it's Mark. What's up, Mark? Now we know. <laughs> Let's dance. That's what it says. You guys danced today. We, we did. did. How'd that go? Good. We practiced nightclub. Hey. Yay, my favorite dance. No, it's not. It's your <laughs> favorite, though. Is it yours, too? Mm -hmm. Is it really? Uh, it's right... It's right up there with waltz. Um, the uh -huh. there's a lot of there's a lot of things being tall that are hard to do well and <laughs> look good. And I think I am finally, after seven and a half years of doing this, I'm finally starting to understand some of the things that you told me five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> being, being being tall gives you an advantage. I think part of it, as far as nightclub goes for me, is the music. So if I, that's one of the reasons that salsa is not big for me, is I can't get behind the music. It all sounds the same to me, but I. What if you liked it? It'd be fucking awesome. I, it's <laughs> salsa super awesome. fun to do. Awesome and if I'm dancing it to Fireball by Pitbull, then I'm totally down. However, usually it's not danced to Fireball. So, um. <laughs> Completely shifting since Mark is from Nebraska. I'm going to be in Omaha, Nebraska on June 6th. I'm going on an RV trip with my niece and nephew. So I'm pretty stoked about that. So we're starting in Omaha, Nebraska. Boom. Well, <laughs> we'll see. I hope my mom's not watching this because she wanted to go and she likes air conditioning. She's not an outdoorsy type. And now my sister might be watching it Yay! and laughing. Are we going to talk about West Coast Swing at all? Is yeah, it we, have people, we have people who are here to learn about how to become great. We'll become good and then great. Then okay, great. someone tell me. I want to hear from someone. They were here. We had what did they say? Did they say? They raised their hands. Okay, they raised their hand. All right, cool. So. Hello? Raise me, their me. Hands. 
Duffy, Duffy from like Tennessee. cool. Yeah. So t do me a favor. If you're if you're here for this specific topic, um, give me like a goal that you're going for, like a little bit of an uh, of an outline, because this can go a lot of different. You know, good to great is you know, do I am I am I what is good? Brian is one of my coaches said to me. I said, hey, is that guy good? What is good, Brian? I don't know. Right. Like a good beginner, a good social dancer, a good competitor. Um, you know, what is great? A great uh, dancer, a great. How much a factor is natural talent Ooh. versus a lot of practice to move from good to great in West Coast swing? Michael, thank you for getting the party started. <laughs> I have, and Ben can attest this, I have a stack of books. I put them in my guest bedroom so I look smart. Um, but about, about a dozen years ago, I kind of got obsessed with that question, and I read every single book I could, and then I read all the stupid studies behind the books, which are really dry and hard to get to, get through. Um, and it does not have an incredible impact. It does to a degree, and we can all weigh on this. What is it? Uh, talent. It. Does talent. It, so Michael's question was, how much of a factor is natural talent versus just lots of practice to move from good to great in West Coast Swing? And a lot of you guys might have heard about the 10,000 hour rule, that it takes 10,000 hours to master something, which allowed me to add up my hours on the dance floor, which several years ago was 36,000. It's probably well in excess of 40,000 at this point. And so you go like, well, it was, am I talented or was it a lot of time? And even the most talented people, you see kids, there was a little Shandy McKeever, this little line dance kid, and the video surfaced of him 20 years ago. And he just, there was a group of teenagers that came out on the floor and he just brought the house down. Super talented. Well, in line dancing, superstars is the top division. And it took Shane another 18 years to ascend and win superstars. So even though he might have been the most talented little six-year-old dancer you'd seen, so it still took the better part of two decades for him to ascend to that level. Um, so I guess natural aptitude matters, but I think that hard work and time really do play out. What's your quote, though? You what are your thoughts? Quote. What's my quote? Practice. Beats talent. beats talent when talent doesn't work but when oh yeah i had a student yeah. yeah so i added to this um hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard yes that one. and i'm gonna swear since this is my last video and i can be a little <laughs> um so what is it it's hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard but when talent works hard you're effed you actually said the word earlier yeah. right i did, you did. <laughs> yeah so um and you see this a lot you see this in just off the top competitors, right? People who are talented enough to achieve a level, but they're rolling off the, and they just don't know the difference, right? And then there are talented people, and I, I won't name names, but they're the, some of the best, or maybe even the best in the West Coast Swing world, who are actually self-conscious, right? And that self-consciousness drives them to be obsessed. They actually are the talented ones, but a few lucky talented ones don't think they're very good, and they're driven to be obsessed. Um, and that's, then you get magical couples that win the U.S. Open for the better part of 10 years. Yeah, that's true. Boom. So, what you got? We have questions. Well, I was going to comment on that because I'm starting down the journey that you started a while ago of going through all those books. Um, and one of the books, The Talent Code, mentions that talent is actually just a made-up construct, what people think of, because they don't see all the work that goes into it in the background. And so you see a kid who's really, really good at something, but really they've been doing it since they were three or four. It's just they're six or seven yeah. and you didn't see the three or four years that went into it. Or you see somebody that you haven't seen forever and you don't know all the work that went into it. And as people, we tend to, how's it go? We tend to overvalue the short-term effects and undervalue the long-term. Mm -hmm. And so we don't value, we think that everything they did, they did in a short period of time and they just caught on to it versus all the work they put in. And one of the things that makes people talented is what they've done in the past. So if you've done something that's very similar, then you're going to step into something else. So if you were a ballet dancer for years, then you've built a lot of skills that you're able to transition to somebody else versus um, if you were tall and gangly and played a few sports growing up and mainly lived on your computer, it's going to take you a while to get there. <laughs> well, we did um, we did a video, What is Two-Step? And we did a little bit of the history of Two-Step. So if you guys haven't seen that, we put like a full day. Like I put eight or 10 hours in that video, both in the research of the homework. And there was a clip in it. We talked about the influences of um, the influences into Two-Step today. And I put a clip of Megan and I uh, dancing. And Megan spins incredibly well. But if we track her back, she's 31, 2? 
I'm this not going to confirm her age on live TV. Yeah. <laughs> so she's been dancing West Coast Swing and Country for 15 plus years, okay? Um, and she had a background of 15 years of figure skating. Her mom's a professional dancer. So when you're watching her spin at the highest level and she is one of the best girls in two-step, um, you're looking at a long history of conservation of angular momentum. Yep. She tough. spins really she's freaking watching. fast. She's hey. matched. And Megan jumped in <laughs> on a lot of these. She's 31. Um, I knew that. I just yeah, so what you're looking at when Megan and I pop out and dance professionally as a couple and all of a sudden her dancing seems to take this big leap, it's built off of 10 to 15 years of, the, of a dance form plus the, um, if you want to call it natural ability, I, mean, I don't know if it's natural ability or not, like if I skated for 15 years, I probably wouldn't stink as bad as I do. It's like <laughs> and a I'm, second nature. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty bad. Yep. All right. Moving on, Duffy's goal is to not feel stupid when she doesn't know what the leader is trying to get her to do because she doesn't know the pattern. And then she adds on. Yeah, which she thinks means she needs to learn. The, she thinks that means she needs to learn the pattern. So yeah, she, like as we get to mastery, it's my mom was saying this. She's like, we're at a family thing right before we came. She says, so you're, you're pretty good in these videos. You just talk. And I said, mom, I've been doing this for over two decades. Like there's just a lot of information, a lot of experiences, and a lot of teaching, and a lot of being a student, and a lot of competing in different worlds, and, and interacting with different people. And so all of that adds up to create a much deeper understanding, right? And so to your point, Duffy, absolutely. Like one of the things I don't have an opportunity to say too many times is I think people need to think like they're a teacher. So if you came into a lesson and you were learning whatever, and someone said, tomorrow, you're teaching a 30-minute class to 50 people on this subject how would you go into that lesson and what would you do in the next 23 hours after that lesson to prepare for teaching it? Because if you think about it that way, you go, oh, shit, I better really pay attention, right? I better write down my notes. I better ask questions. I better, I better plan this out before I even get to the lesson. And then afterwards, I better go through my notes. I might call my coach up and ask a couple questions. I might stay up late that night and practice my material. I might lay out my lesson for the next day. If you think like that, that will really deepen your understanding. Now, you still haven't taught it, right? So by going through that process, that's a whole other process. You'll go through it. And in my early days, I would actually ask, um, I would pay gas money to go to dance events for, uh, from some teaching friends of mine. And my first couple opportunities I had to teach at a, at a weekend event, I would literally just ask, what did I do wrong? What do you think about this? And we drive seven hours back and I would just ask questions. And that was literally just the beginning, right? Like it just keeps going and going and going. So really deepening your understanding of anything you're on and staying on that topic. Um, I, was, I, was, I was watching a business video and they were talking about the uh, cycle of, of mar basically marketing, right? And they were like, there's all these different parts and you have to just pick one at a time to optimize and understand deeply before you go to the next one because it's so easy to jump around to all these things but there's a pattern if you don't optimize the first couple steps steps one two and three it doesn't matter if step eight is great you've skipped that rhymed it did. <laughs> um <laughs> you've you've skipped the foundation and the fundamentals so yeah if if you duffy know all of the base patterns and you know the leader's footwork and the and the followers footwork and you can do that to music and you can be comfortable within it like your your mastery of that is going to go up exponentially. We got anything? What's on the other? Um, I guess the only other thing, if you aren't able to follow a move while you're social dancing, don't feel embarrassed by it because you're out there to have fun, right? And do you have anything on that of how you handle whenever you don't know how to follow something that Elise wanted to do? <laughs> no, we're here to be rock stars. It's not fun. <laughs> I used to be very serious. I never used to smile when I social dance and practice because I was too. serious. Seriously? Yeah. That and would be, be like, awful. You have to have fun. It was fun for me. That was fun for me. Louis is the reason I smile. Yes. Louis will make anyone smile and he'll yell at you if you don't smile. smile I know. Um, I may have told him to. So... Duffy, as far as feeling stupid, um, I think as long as you continue to dance and you don't leave the dance floor, you should not feel stupid at all because it's not necessarily your fault. Um, some things, if you're not used to patterns being led or anything like that, um, 
which you'll come across when you're social dancing all the time, perhaps it was a late lead or anything like that, knowing your footwork will definitely help with all of it. Um, but I think feeling stupid is going a little bit too far, my dear. So just go with it. Go back to your basics and have fun. She's so positive, Miss Emily. You are. Yeah, and in social dancing, right, you're, you're not controlling many of the factors, right? The only thing you can control is you. You don't really have control over who you're dancing with. You don't have control what the next song is going to be. You don't have control over the, whether the floor is slick or sticky. There's so many things that you can't control in those moments that it becomes a skill set in and of itself, right? The high level um, Jack and Jill and Strictly Swing Dancers, it's its own skill set and you just have to do it and do it and do it. So, but the only thing in the beginning you can take control of is what you know. Mm -hmm. So by mastering your own skills and deepening your understanding, um, and I, I, the more I think about it, the more I like that idea. If you are going to take that information, you're going to teach it tomorrow, right? You took a class. You guys hear me do this all the time. Like I'll learn something new these days. It's like business wise. And I will talk about it incessantly because I'm like re going over it in my mind. Yes, we talked about IRAs the other day. Hey. Uh, boring <laughs> stuff. My tax lady. Ugh. Moving on. <laughs> Karen on Facebook says her goal is to compete one day, but she fears that she might be too old. Never. You're never too old to dance and or compete. Yeah, never. Um, and yeah, because there's levels for everything. Um, if we use, I'll use two different examples. We'll start in West Coast Swing, right? And we'll say, let's say I'm an older dancer in West Coast Swing and it's novice and you have 25 year olds. The advantage that you're going to have if you're a novice is you might have at a big competition 50 or 60 competitors, right? So there's a lot of slots that you can work your way up. Let's say in the beginning, you are you don't make any semifinals, nothing. You get no callbacks, right? No little tick marks. Not even one judge wanted to see you in the next round. But because there's 50 or 60, maybe your next competition you get a callback. Maybe two or three callbacks, right? And so maybe now you're close to making the next round. And now maybe you get called back to the next round. So let's say, for instance, it's my mom in a Jack and Jill. Hey, right? I would pay money to see It would be amazing. It. Um, you know, her world championship might be getting a call back. <laughs> making it to semis. Right? Like, so your Mount Everest might not necessarily be the podium. And a lot of our egos get into that. We have to win um, and you want to be amazing. I remember I've told this story early on when I first started competing in jujitsu. It's a form of grappling and uh, kind of like wrestling for old people. And uh, it is because like wrestlers are younger, college. And so I was so obsessed. I was so obsessed. I went two times a day, um, like five days a week. And I took private lessons. I was ready to do my first competition. I wanted to do what I do as a dancer. I want to create a training program and take private lessons. And my Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach goes, Burishnikov, my nickname. You don't even know if you like to fight. Why don't you go see if you like first? And I went, oh, yeah, I'm new. Why, I can't, well, how do I, I don't have an expectation. I don't know if I'm going to be good. I don't know if I'm going to get beat up. So, um, yeah. Yeah. What are you laughing at? Nothing. Burishnikov. Burishnikov. Country world. Yeah, so, and in the country world, there's age divisions, right? They slot it out by ability level, newcomer, novice, intermediate, advanced. That's pretty self-explanatory. They slot it out and they keep the 20-somethings away from the 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 50-somethings, and they do something really cool. They don't even call it by age. They use words like silver, diamond, gold, platinum, <laughs> right? So you don't know, like, oh, is... You know they're in this range, but yeah. you don't know where. <laughs> yeah, so competitively, there's a spot for everyone. Um, the biggest the biggest leap is just doing it the first time. That's If you've never done it, if you get to that floor, you've separated yourself from a bunch of people, right? If you can do it regularly, you've separated yourself from a bunch of people. If you can be comfortable doing that, you're, you've separated yourself from most well, everybody, yeah. right? Um, and so you just work yourself through it. And my general rule, and this is a very easy, low rule, you have to do something three times in dancing before you get to complain. So your first, second, and third time, you need those three competitions before you know how good you are, mm -hmm. right? Maybe I go to my jujitsu competition and I win, but no one, was, no one was good. I go home with my medal thinking I'm good, but maybe no one was good. I have no idea, it's my first competition. But if I do three of them, then I can figure out is the time that I won the anomaly or the time that I did poorly the anomaly, or can I track some progress, I guess on the camera it's this way, some progress. <laughs> 
in that. So if you can commit yourself to doing something three times and then take those three points of information and then you can start to create a track. And you'll know if you like it or not. So Kalashnikov. you don't know if you like to fight. Yeah. Um, and also for West Coast Swing, there are a couple of different options. I know that there's the different levels as far as the ages go for country, but there is sophisticated, which is 35 and up, and there is masters, which is 50 and up. So you do have a couple of different age divisions, but you can also just do a routine if you feel comfortable. Pro-am pro routines or pro-am strictlies, they have those as well. So if you don't feel comfortable taking the leap and just going out there by yourself and not knowing who your partner is going to be, which would be your Jack and Jill or even the strictly, you can have your instructor go out there too. Um, so that sometimes gives people a little bit more uh confidence boost because you can either do your routine so you know what's going to happen and you pick a song and you get all that choreography or you can dance with your instructor which seems to put some people at ease so you have options and you're never too old what you got benjamin jumping over to youtube real quick my goal is to be this is terry p and terry p's goal is to be a great west coast swing social dancer as a follow and stop counting in their head they want to get to where they're just able to feel the patterns without counting. Love it. Boom. Numbers to leave numbers. Benjamin knows what that means. Emily is maybe rolling her eyes. Ooh, yeah. She's been through enough videos. Yeah. So um, Josh Waitzkin's book, The Art of Learning, which if you are working to become from good to great, there's actually two people that I follow in two different ways. Josh Waitzkin is really the guy that's talking about good to great. So the book, The Art of Learning, um, he was a chess champion and a jiu-jitsu champion and a push hands champion. Like, and his methodologies are getting you from the top 5% into the top 1% or the top 1% until the champion. Um, another good way to look at it is a guy by the name of Tim Ferriss. So um, any of Tim Ferriss's material, just go on his blog, and he's got a couple different books in different areas. And Tim Ferriss is more like, how can I get, how can I go from um, nothing to proficient, right? How do I go from nothing to proficient with the shortest amount of time? So he does a lot of experiments with, you know, how quickly can I learn a language to where I can do a three minute interview in that language, right? What would I have to strip away to just get functional quickly? Um, so when we're talking about that, what we call numbers to leave numbers, right? The techniques that you're learning, like counting and the structure till it just goes away. Um, I think we need to kind of just toggle back and forth. We need to keep deepening our understanding and adding time. And if you feel like the progress is too slow, a coach is great for this, right? You go to your coach, you go, I don't have it. And then the coach goes, have what? I don't, I, I, I haven't figured this out. I learned it last week. Duh. <laughs> They're going to be more polite like that. Yeah. Oh, duh. Right? <laughs> okay. I've been doing this for three years. I still don't have it. Keep doing it. Or, duh. <laughs> <laughs> right, but your coach is hopefully going to have more feedback than these two. Um, but your coach will say, hey, look, that's totally normal. I don't know. I don't know what he was saying. I was like, doobie, doobie. No, that's not it. That's duh. Right. No. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's really So, funny. But your coach can tell you, like, is that normal? Right? Is that normal? Yeah, it's normal, man. At this stage, you should be struggling with this. It should be hard. Like, you should be confused at that. I have no idea what um, <laughs> Yes. A lack of perspective as a participant. Yes. Yeah. So if you have a, a coach on the outside that can tell you like, no, you're doing great. Or I think the struggle, that's the first stage, right? And I think this happens in two ways. Number one, you tell the coach, tells the student, we tell our students, no, you're doing great. You just need to stay on that. It's just going to take some time, right? And they go, oh no, that's not it. It's, there's got to be some magic pill, right? And you're like, no, no, no. You need to stay in this area, this part of the flywheel for long enough to understand it before it becomes automatic. Stay in your box. Stay in your box. On the other, what was the other side? I don't know. I lost the my train of thought. The other side is where they don't believe you and they say, no, I'm not doing great. It's because they looked at the video and I look terrible. Oh, there's that. Yeah. And they misunderstand yeah. what, they misunderstand what we mean by you're doing great. It takes time. It takes time. And a coach is going to be your best resource to tell you whether you're, doing great, you're behind schedule or you're ahead of schedule. Yep. Yeah, and I also 
going with the video, video is very, very helpful. Um, one to take to your coach if you do stuff like outside of your lessons, which is highly recommended. Um, but also if you do it with your coach as well, it's extremely telling because they can't always see uh, things that are happening when they're dancing with you. But also know that we are typically our harshest critics. So what may not look great to you is still an improvement and your coach will be an attest to that. They can tell you where you start, like you know where you started, but you might have a false kind of vision of it. So they're kind of able to put you a little bit more on the path. So trust in your coach because they have seen the progress even if you haven't. Very much along those lines. Um, videoing is amazing because you can go back and you can look at a video from two months ago versus a video from last week and you see the difference. Um, expanding on what I meant by our, our students don't always know what we mean by great is we're focusing, we may be focusing on the footwork and your timing within your feet, but you're looking at the overall picture. And so we're like, no, this thing that we're having you work on is really, really good. But you're exactly, you're, you're trying to figure out how to make your arms look good and how to do all these other things, but you're not there yet. Um, and so your coach is very good or can be very a very good resource to help keep you honed in, like Brian said, on the thing that you should be working on at that time. And and it's a relationship. And this is, I like the word coach. It's a little bit different than just teacher instructor. Mm -hmm. Like a coach, um, a coach is going to be, you're going to work with that person. So it is an interactive process. So if you can find someone you can get along with personally or you understand the way that they explain information for us, the people that I've taught over the years that I have felt not very effective is I, despite the fact that I use all my tools, I couldn't get through to them to understand and create a common ground. And yet the ones that I feel that I've been able to crack that code with have been the most successful. And it's a two way street, right? I just might not have been the best coach for that person. Um, so if you can find someone that's a good resource, a good coach, they do not have to be a champion dancer. And that is a complete fallacy that just because people are champion dancers, that means they're champion dancers. So if you're number two in the world, you should talk to the number one guy, right? If you're in the top five, you should talk to the number one guy. If you're going from two to one in a dance sport, you should go talk to someone in a different dance sport that became a champion. That's where those people are the most useful because they've there's only a few people that you can go to that have been to that place. So when Megan and I danced, we went to people that danced in a similar style to us that we got along with that had also gone through the path that we got to and, and we try to get to in winning our division. Um, and even though there was like technical things I could learn from different people, we were trying to go from three to one or from two to one. And there was only a few people who had made that ascension. That's when those people are useful. But the country and the world is scattered with really good dance teachers that none of us know anything about that are great fundamental coaches that get no cred. They have no ego. You don't know who they are. They don't, don't go to dance events and they're brilliant. So if you find some of those, there's probably one in your town. The Kelly Bonds of the world. There you go. What else we got, Benjamin? Going on to Gordon's goal. So Gordon has never had a callback in six years of his competing life. And his goal is to be able to progress and actually make it through to semis or to finals. A coach, number one, a, a coach, right? A person who has helped people get through your struggle specifically, right? Because again, it doesn't matter if this person coaches high level routine competitors, they should be in a studio somewhere who has coached someone because we've had a number of people over the years that have worked their way through the levels who like we used to have to convince to dance West Coast Swing and then they became all-star dancers and watching them go through each step of that progress, finding that person. Number two, shutting out 90% of what's out there, right? 90% of this styling and this pattern and that pattern, and that musicality and that trick and that technique down to just a core couple of things that you can focus on. And I've almost had no luck in getting someone to do this. And I think it would be a brilliant way to go through Jack and Jill's. Like, can you as a leader know a handful of boring patterns till you're bored stiff? They're your patterns. Your friends make fun of you because those are the only <laughs> patterns you do, right? But you live and breathe them and you understand them deeply. Then off of those patterns, what little bits of styling and musicality can you add those? just that small core. Now, in the grand world of West Coast Swing, that's boring, right? Because to dance your five boring patterns and your three variations, 
all night long, every week, every month is boring. But if we're looking at competitively, and I'm a judge standing in around 60 people, I'm seeing you for five or six seconds max. If you do the math, you're getting five or six seconds. So you have to look awesome in those five or six seconds. So if you're doing the same stuff over and over, I don't know. I don't know. Now, does that make you the world champion of Jack and Jill's? Does that make you an all-star specifically? Probably not. But that lays the first foundation to get to the first next step. Because once you've mastered those five, then you go on to the next three, right? Then you have eight and you've got three variations off them and it builds and it builds and it builds. Then you've mastered certain levels of musicality and styling and connection. But now you can add on the next layer to each of those and it will build. But I would push away 90% of the information, focus on a little bit and get a coach to help me go through the process. What you got? Because that was good. I killed that one. <laughs> totally killed it. Um, yeah. So I talked about staying in the box earlier, but I had a couple of students who loved West Coast. Um, speci- well, they loved everything, but when they did West Coast specifically, they got a little crazy and they weren't making uh, semifinals. They weren't getting callbacks. They weren't doing any of that. Um, same in the country world too. They were not getting good marks at all. So as much as he and they hated it, um, I told them to stay in a box and we only did basic patterns, but it was on time. It was clean. It was danced well. And their marks were just off the charts from where they were. So as boring as it may be, that is what you have to start with, especially in newcomer and novice, because if you are off time, but you're doing this really cool move, doesn't matter. And they don't know if you've done the same pattern three times in a row, most likely. Um, So stick with your basics, stick with what you're comfortable with. And once you're ready and you can kind of do different variations, not too many, um, that should also help your scores. Because again, it's not necessarily boring. I had one of my best dances was only doing sugar pushes, sugar tucks, left side passes, and one whip. It was one of my best dances ever with one of my beginner students in Austin. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to Emily said something called in the box, right? Which might not make sense to you, which is why we need to have a coach. So if I said back in the box to one of my students, they would know exactly what I mean. So the coach is first and foremost in the box. And because the coach, you have to have that terminology. So one word tells the, the, the student and communicates to you as a student exactly what we need to do next. So back in the box is back to our fundamentals, right? We've already defined our fundamentals between the teacher and student, student relationship, what our focus is, right? And I had one of my most successful students, Erin Abel. Um, she was really good, right? The, the progress through her dancing as an amateur dancer, and she would have been a professional dancer if she cared to. She didn't. She had a day job. But at one point, about a third the way through her dance career, um, she was getting pretty good, and she had all this physical ability, and she started to do all this stuff, and her marks started to tank. And I went back in the box, right? Shut out all the rest of that 90%, and she's a really smart person, and she's talented, so she could take all of that on, but it still wasn't, she didn't have a mastery of it. So the coach says, back in the box, we keep going, and then again, continue to slowly build the skill set. That's the most efficient way. It's not the most fun way, but it's the most efficient way. Yeah. Just commenting on not the most fun way. Um, not everybody's this way, but from my own personal experiences, I have to check my ego a lot. Um, <laughs> um, and I have to remind myself that I pay Brian for a reason and that whenever he tells me to do something, I need to do it because it's proved out time and time again that I thought I knew better. And I didn't, and I delayed things, and I pushed my progress back because of that. Um, from taking lessons with other people in order to see what their thought processes were, it was what Brian was teaching me, just worded differently, um, or um, trying to figure out why something was going wrong, and it took him way too long for to realize that it was probably my fault, not Emily's. Um, if I'd taken that advice about two and a half years ago, we'd be a lot further along. Um, but. <laughs> But uh, the biggest thing is it's not fun because we do have to, as we're learning and we're learning more, you're like, no, I put all this work in. I know what I'm doing. And you do, but you don't. 
Um, and so having to do that ego check every now and then when your coach tells you, you get back in the box and you're like, I don't want to be in the box. But if don't no go to your corner, go yep. to your box. Yep. So the question at that point is, do you want to continue to progress and do you want to continue to grow? Because that's what the coach is wanting you to do. And if the goal has changed to just having fun and you don't want to be in the box, you got to communicate that. But your coach is going to help you stay on that goal. Yeah, it's super, it's super hard when you're smart, right? Because when we're smart, you think you can figure out the better way. And from the time that I was a college runner to dancing, you hear young, talented people say, when I was in high school, moving into college, you know, we're all going to which college are you going to run at and that type of stuff. And I remember people go, well, I'm going to be like more efficient. I'm going to figure out the best workouts to run. I'm going to figure out the shortcut because I'm smart and I'm talented. And to this day from my original running group, the guy who was like the fifth best guy on our team is ran the fastest marathon time out of all of us and is still running fast to this day. And he was the, this is actually interesting. It just came to my brain. And he was the only guy who shut up and listened to our college coach. Right? The rest of us thought we could figure out a way around it. He was the only guy who just shut up and did what he was told. And we had a legitimate college coach, Tom Dadarian, who was uh, literally wrote the book on the Boston Marathon. If you look up the Boston Marathon book, he wrote the book. So you're talking about a guy that finished seventh in the Boston Marathon and ran with all the best guys. And we were arrogantly, ignorantly trying to find the shortcut to his methodologies. And this guy was the only guy who listened from day one and Early on, he was not the most talented kid, but over the time, he actually proved out to have the long-term most successful career, if you will, as a runner. Going to try and get Michelle's question here from Facebook. Um, so the question is, is there a place for balance as far as feedback goes, I believe, um, to challenge dancers? So challenging feedback is great, but also it can sometimes hurt. Yeah, good question. That's, I'm not a big fan at all. Like, I give no feedback when I'm social dancing. Like, okay. even here in the studio, no. we teach private lessons, we teach group classes, and at the social dance, you have to pull my teeth before I'm going to give you any advice whatsoever. Because that time period for me is just, hey, this is just a fun period. Um, so, if we're talking about feedback from other dancers in, in uh, classes and dances, and eh, eh, bad and it's also i've i've literally to this day never seen a good scenario where someone in a class or a group or a social dance setting said hey you need to keep your elbow down blah 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 you need to stay connected back like that never works never works and in fact in every case anyone has opened their mouth about that stuff is terrible you look like a jerk. and it caught you look like a jerk and the jerks exist we've tried to kick them out they still keep coming back um, they exist everywhere, right? So in that scenario, it sucks and plug your ears. But this is where a coach can be helpful in developing that relationship, right? Because remember before I said it's a two-way street, you have to say, hey, look, I don't have thick skin for this. So you have to be careful with any criticism or negative feedback, right? And then the coach can just make everything positively, right? Carrot versus stick. They can forget the stick and just put the carrot and tell you you're doing great, more of this, and head down this path, and keep it very positive. There are some people who are like negatively motivated. I actually don't work really well with those people because I tend to be not a very negative dance teacher. Um, I'm much more carrot, would you say? Am I? Am I not? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, so I've had some people that like the kick in the ass, and I'm not a good kick in the ass type person. Um, it works much better with me. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it does actually. So finding... Um, finding a relationship with a teacher and you can tell them, hey, look, this is this is where I'm at, right? Because as teachers, it's very difficult, especially traveling and coaching, where I just see someone come in for an hour or two. I have no idea what their history is. I have no idea what their personality is. I have no idea where they're at. And they go, I just want to work on blah. But with no context, it's a huge guessing game in the lesson, right? So, but by having a long-term... Oh, do we have a... We got an expansion. On expansion the on the question. Yeah. We'll hop off and... Yeah. So the expansion is um, this person has a condition that affects her balance, and so she avoids social dancing. Balance. Yeah. Is there a place for balance challenge dancers? I heard. Do you have some? Do you know? I just feel like anyone should be able to dance anywhere, really. Um, I think if balance is an issue, you can kind of be upfront with whoever you're going to dance with. Um, 
but that should not keep you from going out social dancing at all. Um, and if someone says something negatively to you while you're social dancing, you don't need to dance with them again. Um, because like we said, that's not the place to critique or be rude or anything like that. So I think that as long as you're up front and you say, hey, dude, not the best with spins. My balance is a little wonky. Um, then that should be, I mean, the leader should be able to adjust and and go from there. And if you if he leads you in a turn, it doesn't go well, say, hey, don't do that again, and then continue dancing. Yep, exactly, 100%. I would, kind of like we said, the relationship with a coach, I think it's completely okay in a social dance to um, give someone a quick heads up where you're at. Hey, I'm really new, I only know the basics. Or, hey, I've got some balance issues, can you please not spin me? Or I've got a bad shoulder. Can you please be really careful with this shoulder putting it in this position? Yeah. Um, that's a great place to start. Now, remember before we said there's the dinglings. There are going to be some dinglings regardless. Expect a percentage of people to not get it, to forget, to be jerks. There's going to be a small percentage. Overwhelmingly not. But if the first person you get to happens to be the dingling, that's not representative no. of the room. Um, but I think preempting that early and just being honest with people, it's also super helpful, again, as a coach or a social dancer. If someone comes to me and says, I'm remembering a dance I had in Indianapolis years ago with a young girl, and she looked <laughs> like she would be really good. She, like she moved good out of the corner of my eye, but I didn't pay close attention. When I danced with her, I was like, oh, I'm going to get the hot shot. And I started into the hot shot stuff, and I didn't know I had a beginner. And it was very difficult, right? <laughs> My own fault, because I like I accidentally prejudged the wrong direction, right? But if I had either gone back to what I would do normally, social dancing, and dance some basic patterns first and be paying attention right at the beginning of the dance, or if the person came to me, she was not an uncomfortable dancer, but if she came and said, hey, I'm just new, I only know this, it would have helped to get off to a better start. All right, so yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, so. Um, so there was a suggestion for balance challenge dancers to see a physical therapist. Um, is that something that could be helpful? What are your if thoughts? that was suggested or not. Yeah, so don't know if that was suggested or not to um, Michelle. Uh, for me personally, my thoughts it could be helpful, but there's just so many things that affect balance that a physical therapist may or may not be able to help you. It may be a waste of money because um, it could be a muscle issue. It could be something going on with the inner ear. It could be the bunch of stuff I don't know about. I'm just throwing out the two that I do know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's just so many things that could be happening with it um, that it's just hard to know what would potentially help. I think falling back on what Emily and Brian were saying of going out and having fun is really the yeah. biggest thing. Is it? Um can you scroll down, please, for a second? Michelle, is it? Yeah. yeah. Michelle, is it like an inner ear problem or a physical balance issue? Because that's, in my experience, I've only had a couple, but they have existed. People that were members of the dance community, um, but struggle with some inner ear and vertigo balance issues, some legit balance issues. Those are the only people I came across that couldn't improve their balance from that standpoint, right? That was a struggle for them. It was just... It was there on day one, and even as they got better, it was just a struggle that they had. And, of course, they learned their own mechanisms for coping, how much they dance, who they dance with, and all that stuff. Um, but if, if it's that, that, in my experience, that's been, um, that's been something that I've not seen people be able to physically overcome. Now, if it's a technical dance issue, balance issue, which in my experience is almost everybody else, in my experience, it's not necessarily a physical therapist. Again, and I'll, it's the same way, you're likely to spend more time in and around the dance world than you are in a physical therapy office. And I've been there, done that. I've been an athlete my whole life. I've been in and out of physical therapist's office. And for me, it wasn't great because it wasn't particularly sports specific, number one. It would have taken such a long period of time to develop a deep relationship with a physical therapist for them to know my very specific issues because they tend to put you through, oh, you don't have mobility in this area, and then they'll, they'll shuffle you to someone who's, in essence, an intern that puts you through a protocol, which those are the basics, right? So for basic human movement, that's a pretty good thing to do. 
but for the specificity of dancing, oh, I had to do that, right? right? The specificity. The specificity of dancing. <laughs> um, I had to make sure I spit that out correctly. Um, I actually think a dance coach would be better, right? Like we've done a lot of turn technique videos with Megan and she kind of knows what I know throughout the years, but she also brings a bunch of ice skating stuff and a bunch of drills and a bunch of balance things and a bunch of um, eyes closed drills. And so I think someone in the dance world um, would probably be a better resource for me. But let's see what she says. Yep. Oh, maybe. You want to say that first before Hang you on. Use it? Why not? Balance nerve. So it's a nerve issue. I don't know what a nerve issue means. It's something that you wouldn't be oh. able to fix without more than likely surgery. Oh, got it. Probably leave it. At yeah. So then I think I think at that point it's just communicating with people. That Is I've had a, I've had a couple of people that had like just problems. They couldn't. Um, you know, it's not it's not like a practice your turns is going to overcome that. Um, and so just letting someone know, hey, I love West Coast Swing. There's tons of stuff you could do without turns. There's tons of things you can explore that don't have to have hardcore turns to uh, to affect your balance too much and by being upfront with people. Um, and then you'll find people that, to Emily's point, will like to dance with that, like people who like to n not do hard patterns like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, going on to another question from Gregory. Mario Robau once taught dancing close, like on a pizza box. Do we ever mix old styles with new ones? Yeah, so we did um, a really cool Q&A with a guy by the name of Forrest Altman. He was a dance historian. And he has been fun for me to talk to. I've had three conversations with him. Specifically about, you know, should West Coast Swing change its name? And what's the history of West Coast Swing? And how can you predict where we're going by looking at other dance forms? Because Forrest, this is what he does for fun. Looks up 2,000 references on a specific subject. And what was this? Oh, the dancing on the pizza box. So what... What I asked for is a question. I said, what can the new school learn from the old school? And he said, you can learn new tips and tricks, right? Because you come in today and you don't know that West Coast Swing was danced to really, really fast music on a pizza box, very tight, and that very tight specific footwork shag influenced was a thing, right? If you come in today, you see the slower music and the athleticism of dancing and the Zook influence today, and you don't even know that when I started, there was a shag influence and a tight. So those skill sets you don't have, you've never developed. Um, so I think looking back is good. And then for the old timers, which I don't know if a lot of you guys are watching this, but shit's going to change. It's okay. It's going to change. It's got, like nothing ever goes backwards. It's always going forward. So um, I applaud the, chan the, 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 the different music selections and styles and all that stuff. Um, it's what we have so far. It's what we have so far. And Randy's a PT. We love Mario too. I love Mario. Actually, I was trying to think about the last dance event that I was at, mm -hmm. and it was actually an event called um, Dance Pure Dance Chicago with Mario Rabau and Matt Claire and Tim Johnson and Marin Oslak up in Chicago. South Chicago. So that was, the, that was the last dance event I was at. And we're like, we're going to run one of those in Louisville in a couple months. And we haven't danced for a couple months. And that's still going to be the case because we don't have an event till like July now or August. August. Holy cow. Yeah. Ah! If I had an event, I'd run that thing. Well, but I wouldn't run it with social dancing. You have an event. I would run it, but I wouldn't run it with social dancing. <laughs> The event is different now than it was in May. Right. <laughs> May was a different decision. It's true. Um, <clears throat> now, those are the questions that we had. Um, there are dance PTs now. One is West Coast focused. Um, yeah. There's also um, Eric Zimmer yeah. and what he's able to do. Yeah. Yeah. To that, to your point, Randy, I agree. And. I'm glad you are a PT and, and rolling in on this. And it kind of the idea of, and the reason why I was like, you know, I don't think a PT is great for dancing. It's just specifically this. It takes a long time if you go into, and you're a dancer, so you know this, right? But if you walk into a PT that doesn't dance and you say, this is what I do and these are the things that I need, it's not the, the clearest path. So it takes a long time to develop that relationship. And there are some people who are brilliant, right? They are physical therapists and they're dancers, um, a guy by the name of Eric Zimmer comes to mind. Um, 
Alyssa from Colorado. Alyssa from Colorado. So there are some people who are um, have that training and that knowledge and that expertise, and they're a part of this, and they're able to. Um, it's great for a dancer because you go and you go, hey, I'm having trouble with my spins, and they're like, boom, I got it. I went to school for this stuff, and I know exactly how to apply it to this exact thing. If you find one of the the only bad part is only a few of those people, and they live very far apart. We're actually lucky. We have um, a PT here in Louisville who did the majority of his focus with ballet dancers. Really? Yep. Um, Why haven't I seen that guy? It's Aaron's friend, Rob. I have been to Rob. Yeah, he did a lot of work with ballet dancers. And he shuffled me off to someone in his office. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but also <laughs> he knew what was happening and he knew what was behind yeah. it. I was broke and he wasn't going to fix it. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see here. We did have some conversation that we kind of skipped past because we were looking at questions, um, but thinking about the kind of being careful with the goal setting and people talking about thinking Jack and Jill's are just social dancing and they consider it a success whenever they have fun during the Jack and Jill's. And so I'm talking about goal setting and making sure that goals are within a way to be successful and feel good about them. Yeah. So like specifically whether so, having fun is a good goal? Well, not having fun is a good goal, but making sure if you're just starting and your goal is to win Jack and Jill's, well, you're probably going to be unhappy for a long time. Um, if you're just starting, your goal is to get first place in newcomer. There's a chance you're going to be unhappy for a while. So setting goals and incremental goals and making sure. Small goals. Yep. Small goals into big goals. Yep. Yeah. If I were, if I had someone that was starting uh, some sort of competition, I I would try hard to keep the word winning out of the conversation at all because kind of just going my way. I don't usually say this in a lesson, but since it's not a lesson and you're not paying me. It would be arrogant to think that you could win because you're you're ignorant. You don't know much about it. You're new at it. Like you must think you're really stinking good that you're going to go into something that other people have been doing more than you and win, right? So there's so much unknown. So if you are new at that, I would take any expectation off the table for the first three competitions. I would certainly, if I had a coach, I'd build my skill set. I would say, what do I focus on, coach? How do I approach this? Um, we do some practice Jack and Jill competitions each year here in Louisville, and we literally run it like a competition because a lot of the things, the struggles, aren't even the technical anchor step, timing, teamwork. What's the other Technique. one? Technique, timing, teamwork, this stuff that gets spewed around. It's Most of it, stuff. it is good stuff, but like <laughs> when you show up, where do you get your number? Who pins the number on you? What is a number? Where does it go? What do I wear? Well, what is, where do I line up? What is lining up? What's a floor mom, a deck captain, a floor coordinator? What are these things? And why do I need to listen to them? Right, and where do they go? And, and how's it going to work? And what's the competition going to be structured as? And what do the judges look for? Forget that question. You don't get to ask that for three times. Listen to your coach, right? <laughs> so there's so many of those things. And we run these practice competitions. We've done them for country dance. We've literally put up sheet heats like they do at competitions and we run them just like we even have the announcers we play actual comp music someone announcing you on the floor how do you walk out on the floor all of those steps of the process so for your first three comps get through making that comfortable and don't worry about winning i was just gonna say so for some of my students when they first started there are in the country world for instance newcomer for females is a very very large um group of people so, and the male has also grown which is great but we we make little small goals so at each comp we might say um, what's your goal for this one i just want to beat one person i want to beat one person nothing about winning nothing about yeah, we've done that, yeah. yeah um that doesn't even that's not on the table if it does happen awesome but her and many people's goals have been like I just want to beat one or two people, or I don't want to mess up any of my routines because the nerves get to you. Um, the floor craft can sometimes be an issue. So I think having those small goals, whether you're going to little comps, big comps, whatever, um, having those along the way are extremely helpful too. I want to chime in because one of my most successful students, Erin, she, um, at her first competition, I said, look, she didn't start at the newcomer level. She started a level up and I said look it's gonna be it's it's gonna be bad like it's not gonna go well the first you're talented and you're smart she's a class valedictorian she danced before and I said and she listened I said your expectation is just to get through everything clean 
just get through your routines, right? And we went in, she came in last place and she high five and she's like, check number one, right? <laughs> and it took some time before she became uh, a winner in her division, right? Yeah. She got close. There were times where she got super close and we cried afterwards because she didn't quite get the goal. But literally comp number one, she took last place and was like, check coach, step one taken, here comes the train. But she didn't get to the top of the podium for several years. Several years. Yeah, she has a couple of world titles. Yeah. Um, the more that, so I used to very much be that way. These two can attest um, of I wanted to win or I wanted to play second because I knew I wasn't going to get first. Um, but the more that I do this, the more that. There's only two people dancing, Benji. That wasn't a good goal. <laughs> at some comps, yes. <laughs> you won, no, you won your first one. Yes. And then, um, you, you know. and then I purposely lost because I kept moving up for competition. But. What I've learned over the years as I've gotten older and worked through a bunch of things um, is that for me, and this is what I try to tell my students as well, is dancing, is a, the judging is subjective and you can't control what the judges like and what the judges don't like. And then also things click for people at different paces. So you may be working on the same four or five things that somebody else is and one, two, and three click for them early, but they don't click for you until you get four and five in place and then one, two, and three click. Okay. Um, so for me, what I've transitioned to over the past, and this is newish for me, over the past eight-ish months, since October probably, um, is really just going out there and I want to leave my best dance on the floor and I have particular things in the dances that I'm working on. So um, in West Coast, in my, I have a bad habit of pulling Emily out of her anchor because um, I know what moves next and I want to do the next move. So did I not pull Emily out of her anchor? Um, or in waltz, did I lower correctly before I moved in all of my um, ones going in or for my threes down into my ones? Um, and so I have these things in my head that I've been working on. And that's my goal is to get through that for that dance. And if I've done that, well, then it's about making progress at this point for me. Um, and if you continue to make progress, it continues to be fun. And at that point, you don't get mad because you haven't won. And then you give up and you burn out. And another thing that made me think, listening to you talk about that stuff is... Another great resource that you have is not even necessarily a teacher, right? So if we're looking at the West Coast swing world or the country world and we're looking at the champions and we all want to learn from them um, and we're on our journey up, someone that's just made the leap that you're trying to meet, make might be a great resource. And I've done this in, this in the studio, right, where we have a student that's trying to move from one level to another. And so I kind of go through all my information. They're kind of not buying it. And I said, well, go talk to that person because last year she was in the same position and she just made the leap, right? And maybe I'm the teacher and I have all this technical stuff I can tell you, but they'll tell you emotionally what it was like, what the journey was like because they just went through it. And I, it might have been 15 or 18 years ago before I was in that same spot, right? I'm, I was still a competitor. I've still had that. What are you laughing at? I'm just smiling. It's just my face. So um, <laughs> there are people who are just ahead of you that can be great resources. Um, so actually, I, I enjoy listening to Ben um, because he's probably more relatable for most people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Did you have a ballet background, Ben? No. Did you? Yes. Did you dance growing up, Ben? No. Did you? Yes. And Ben's dancing with Emily. How hey. you like them apples? <laughs> Um, Yan Lee says that they are only interested in enjoying social dancing, not competitions. What is a good goal for somebody who only wants to social dance? Social dancing. <laughs> yeah, have fun. Having fun social dancing. Yeah, have fun. And Yan, you have to set your own expectation, right? What is fun for you? What makes a fun dance for you? Is it that you remember to do this cool styling option? Is it that you just didn't have to count? Is it that you just enjoyed the music? Is it that you enjoyed um, dancing with a particular partner? So if you can set up your own goal within that and say, how do I get more of that, right? How do I cultivate more of that? Um, that would be a good way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want a new challenge, you can just try a new dance so that you could social dance to everything. These are West Coast swing dancers. We are cult dancers. We don't want to do anything else. You can do cha-cha to West Coast. You can do rumba to West Coast. You can do two-step to West Coast sometimes. And you know what they play at West Coast swing events? They play cha-cha songs and they play hustle songs. Some nightclubs. <laughs> and they Some waltzes. Yeah. That people and we West Coast swing to all of them. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I think finding what what a good dance is for you when you if you're enjoying social dancing, what is that for you, and how can you cultivate your skills to get more of that, um, and and less of the stuff that you don't like within it, and then you have upped your game and had more success in your social dancing. Yep. That's what we have. Two steps too. Yes, they play two steps as well. Oh, here we go. Gordon. Gordon says, for me, hmm. um, sorry, for me, opportunity to dance early bird for fall. Oh, so Gordon's goal, one of them, is to dance with every follower in the room Ooh, that's during like the a dance. Challenge. Fill your dance card. Have you ever done that? Dance with everyone in the room? Yeah. yeah. Purposely. Purposely. Yeah. I have a couple times. Yep. Well, so one of the things that you've had us do at events before, we did this at uh, Jason yeah, and Sophie's yeah, yeah, yeah. event, um, was Snowball. because at Jason and Snowfies, or Snowfies, you just said Snowball. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, sorry, Sophie. One of the uh, things that they had was a spirit award. And so um, Brian's really good at these big shows of... Um, I'm really competitive too. <laughs> yeah. So Brian had, we had, we had a ton of people there and Brian had us all basically line up. And at the same time, we had like 30 people walk to the other side of the floor and pick somebody to dance. So That's things fun. like that are definitely fun to do. And so it, having fun in social dancing, dancing with everybody in the room or coming up with fun ways to make sure people are included, looking for the person who hasn't danced in the past five or six songs because they, and because they don't look like they would be fun to dance with, maybe. But they actually probably really are. Looks can be deceiving. Yep. They can. There was a tall, skinny, gangly guy once at an event. It wasn't you. He was way, he was way skinnier than you. Oh, I've heard the story. And he, and he looked really awkward. And then one of my really good girls um, came back. And they were like, oh, my God. This guy's really good to dance with. And pretty soon, he was the rock star in the room. He didn't look like it, but he was. Yeah. We had a couple of those at DCS, too. Yep. They're everywhere. But don't judge a book, a book by its cover. Dance with everyone. So Rand said that the day before Jack and Jill's, he likes to dance with all the followers or suggest to dance with all the followers that you haven't danced with. Before Jack and Jill yeah. in general. Not yeah. Like um, Yan Lee went on and said, likes to have more involved in the follower part is very helpful to improve the lead. Mm -hmm. So do you think that learning the followers part is beneficial? To leading 100 percent pool players who are right-handed that learn to play left-handed actually improve their game right-handed boom there's studies on that yeah so it will deepen your understanding of the dance right if you learn to lead then you will understand what the leader is supposed to be doing within certain patterns and then you'll be able to identify what they're not doing in those patterns and be able to make up for it and adjust from the followers role which is what i call thinking like a teacher yes um Michael, one thing I'm back on topic. One of the things about being good to great is Brian asks me this all the time. One of his old coaches asks him is what is good and what is great. It's kind of why we're taking the approach of what are people's individual goals? Um, because great to me is going to be very different than great to somebody who just wants to social dance. Um, but great question of what does being in the zone mean to us? You want to start? You get the mic. I can start with that. Going back to all of my stuff that I've been reading, all of my um, self-development things that I've been, actually I don't read them because I like to do things while I drive. I have to be doing two things at almost all times. It's really bad with my ADHD. Um, so I listen to audiobooks a lot. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but one of the things is for me being in the zone is being in a place where you're being very purposeful and conscious of what you're doing um, is something I've started doing more and Emily and I practice today and, and it was very beneficial for me to explain kind of what my process was, but I've gotten to where I'm very, or I'm being audible with everything that I'm doing. Um, so we're working through nightclub and as I'm moving away, um, I'm saying what my thought process is out loud so that way I'm conscious of it. It's beneficial to her as my partner and somebody who's very knowledgeable about dance. She's like, why are you thinking about that that way? Um, and we fixed a couple of things today because of that. Um, but for me, being in the zone is being very conscious and purposeful of whatever it is that you're working on. So in dancing, if you're working on your anchor step and waiting away, you're being very purposeful and calling out loud, okay, as I put my foot down and my rolling, I'm now rolling through my foot and my hip is now settling. Um, and being in the zone to me is that purposeful and con um, conscious. And that's probably a different zone than Michael was talking about. 
Potentially. Right? Because I think the, the way people, the, the unconsciousness of things, right? Yeah, right. The flow and the, that's the new, see, those of us are a little older, Benjamin, it used to be called the zone. Nowadays, they call it flow state. Right? <laughs> That's how you would know it, right? What? Yeah. It's flow flow state. state. Yeah. So like being in the zone and flow state, right? Like uh, athletes that get on streaks and they can't miss a shot, those types of things. And it's just unconscious competence. Um, so that's what I think the zone is, right? And then I think really the question becomes like, how do we get there? And um, I don't know that you can, I don't know that you can get yourself there at will. What's that? about an art of learning. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're, we're getting there. Oh, we're getting there. We're getting there, right? <laughs> Let him build. <laughs> so you have to build all the foundations, all your fundamental skills, right? So for those of you guys who are new, you're counting. And then at some point, you stop counting. And then you learn about musicality, and you're like, oh, I got to count the music. And then it's not going to match my patterns the same way because I got to learn this different way of counting. And then all of a sudden, that goes away. And now you're at this, this uh, you have the ability to be musical within your patterns, right? But then you're not in the zone because... You're still kind of thinking about it. You're not counting it anymore. You're feeling it, but it's not just happening. And then you have that dance where it's in the zone. You have that night. It's in the zone. Everything seems to work, right? And then the question is, how do we get ourselves back to that state with regularity? Um, it's very difficult in a social dance setting, right? Way too many variables. Different partners, different songs, different speeds of music, different floors, different times of night and day. Um, in a competitive scenario, to Ben's point, the book, The Art of Learning, you can start to control the variables, right? You can create a warm-up process that's the same. You can listen to the same music. You can eat the same foods. You can do the same stretches. You can practice your routines the same ways. You can walk to the arena 13 minutes before you dance every single time, which means when you backtrack to your practices, you can be listening to the music in the same way, stretching the same way, walking in your practice 13 minutes before you start you can start to um, groove that process in the zone, right? So it's a little awkward to do for social dancing, right? I don't think we're going to be doing stretches and eating, you know, uh, almond blueberries, and, blueberries and, and listening to your favorite song and walking through styling things in the hallway before you gear yourself up okay, to maybe, social dance. Maybe, maybe you do want to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. However... No. You know, but you could you could put yourself in a specific mindset. You could approach. You could give yourself a little mantra. You could wear your lucky shoes. You could do some things that are are comfortable for you, that are natural for you, to let it be in that flow state. So, um, if that doesn't answer it, let me know because that's a fascinating question. So we talked about it's important for the leaders to know the followers' part, uh, footstep or footsteps footwork. Um, how beneficial is it for followers to understand how to lead? Because you lead very well. Thank you. Um, I think it's important in, in the same way I think that followers should absolutely know their footwork first and have that down pat. Um, but I think knowing where the leaders are coming from and what they have to do to get us into specific points is very, very important as well. So just as important as it is for the leaders to understand the followers, I think followers understanding the leader footwork is um, extremely beneficial. But again... Not until after you've mastered your own footwork. Good point. Good point. That's all I got. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's super beneficial, right? Like if you have mastered all of your basic footwork from your particular role and, and the, the basics of that stuff, understanding the other role should be relatively achievable because you've just mastered your version of it so you can master the other side. Um, but from there, becoming good at it, and this is why I kind of told Emily that you know she's a good leader because... I know all the follower stuff, right? That's I teach girls followers today, 2020, not just yeah. girls. Um, back in the day, there was different rules around dance teachers in, in the city, and I actually taught a lot of guys, a lot of guys as the follower. But the thing that I lack a little bit is just because there's typically more uh, followers and leaders in a dance community, Emily actually has done the leader's role, like for real to music, a lot more than I have done the followers role, right? She can lead all of our routines in the studio and for all of our students and she, they, like on the regular, she does that. I can follow them too, but it's not as comfortable and I don't do it all the time, right? So there's some time in the saddle that doesn't matter how much 
technique and mastery you understand. I don't have the time in the saddle running the two-step routines as the follower. And if I had to do, I could not do Megan's routine at all, <laughs> at all. What else we got? Switching to dance shoes real quick. What uh, recommendation on where to get a good pair of dance shoes? Oh, sorry. I skipped one. Before that was best shoes for West Coast Swing and then where to get a good pair of dance shoes. So um, if you go to our Facebook page, scroll down. A couple of days ago, we uh, shared. Yesterday. Maybe just yesterday. We shared an article. If you go to West Coast Swing Online, just type in Google West Coast Swing Online, um, West Coast Swing Dance Shoes, and you'll find we did a whole comp comprehensive article on all the different options in there. I think I have the shoes that I've been wearing that are my current favorites. Um, I don't know if you have the yeah. red one. Yeah, they're over there. Um, Port Dance is the one that I wear. Um, so there's a, a whole breakdown of different options, and I don't think there's a single best. There's also in that article a uh, link to a Facebook um, discussion that went on. It would be too hard to scroll back and find, but it's linked to in that article where people shared all sorts of like DIY solutions to making your own shoes, and people shared, it was like a hundred and something comments of good ideas. So find that, Google West Coast Swing Online, Dance Shoes, find our article and dance connection, which sells a lot of shoes is having a 40% off sale. And so if you find that post, um, on our Facebook page, scroll down last couple of days. Um, there's a link to our article. There's also a link to dance connection cause they're having a 40% off sale and they sell most of the common, um, shoes, not my current favorites, but the ones that I wore before that and a bunch of the ones that you guys wear. Yeah, we had Dance Shoes of Tennessee at uh, DCS, so that's actually, I think, where Brian got his red and blue shoes. Um, I love my suede boots. Uh, I think Dance Connection has a version of those boots. And then um, the good old trusty strappy sandal for me. I'm loving that you guys have fans. <laughs> Rand says, I want to dance with Emily. And Gordon says, I want to dance with Ms. Megan. <laughs> Renz wants to dance there too. No one wants to dance with you and I, Ben. I'll dance with you. You're tall. It's good. It's really good to follow a tall leader. <laughs> I don't get to be uh, led much because I'm so tall, but Brian did start off as my teacher for the first three or four months. Yeah, trying to lead Ben in two step is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. If you're five feet tall, you can't even reach his head. That's a true story. It's true. You can't, your fingers come up. If you're five feet tall, your fingers come up to here. That's true. <laughs> That's awesome. Karen we'll had a be, wonderful uh, dance with you in Calgary. Karen, I'm so sorry I missed you in Calgary this year. That event is great. I love Calgary. Um, I hope to be back. That was such a great, great time. And then someone said a nice thing about us earlier. Really? Oh, yes, they did. Yeah, uh, he keeps going past things. Well, yeah, I'm trying to keep it on conversation here. Sandra said that she loved, loved, loved all of these classes and appreciates every moment that we put into doing them. Helped her retain her sanity during all the isolation and said thank you very much. You are welcome, Sandra. What do you have to say, Emily? Because I have something else to say to that, Sandra. It helped keep our sanity too. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> it did. It did. And now we, I, I'll be honest, it got, is a little grinding. I appreciate you guys helping out last week. Um, when I added up, yeah, way to go. <laughs> when I added up, I th it's over 105 videos we put out live, over 105. And when you figure it takes four of us, right? So just the videos alone is 400 and something man hours, 420. And when you figure we get here a little early, we stay late, and there's prep time, like things run over, and things run over. <laughs> we we are probably well in excess. This is staggering. E easily in excess of 800 man hours into these videos um, and we didn't charge a dime Boom. We love you guys yeah. yeah we did and it was it was for sure it was part of our sanity at this stage we're ready to get back to work like all of us <laughs> um, but it's been an enjoyable process we've learned a lot we've made some new friends we've been able to interact uh, in a way that we have not um, been able to even though a lot of you guys feel like you know us from videos I was able to introduce more people um, to everybody um, cause these guys are awesome. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. I always want to. So, um, yeah, so we've enjoyed the process. It's been really cool. And that's why I said I'm not a hundred percent sure. So I will send out an email next Tuesday. Um, every Tuesday the email comes out. And so I'll shoot you a message to let you know what the, it's the rain. Oh, it's the rain. Yeah. It's been nice here, but the rain has been kicking up. 
thunderstorms here in Louisville. Um, we've, we're going to do some live video formats moving forward. I'm not sure how that's going to live. Um, Probably closer to the Tuesday, Thursday format. If yeah. It's not live. I just, I just don't know. I just don't know. Um, but there will we'll hopefully be some, cause I like this format. Um, we might do it on, you know, specialized topics where we kind of do it in a deeper format. Maybe you have an hour on a specific topic where you can really create a curriculum, dig in and that type of stuff. So there'll be something more. Um, yeah, it's an interesting format, um, that we'd like to explore cause I've learned a ton, 20 something years in dancing. And I learned a ton through this process. What are the, in our opinions, the best dances to help with cross training for West Coast Swing? What do you say? Hustle. Really? I think that's one of them. Lindy's another one if you want to do that. Interesting. Shag, if you want leader's footwork stuff. Two step. For West Coast? Yep. For a leader and follow? Yep. Interesting. Yeah, right? How fun is that? I would have thought that you would have said two-step, so I'm glad you said something different. I would not have thought of two-step crossing over with West Coast. Yeah, I think, well, I think two-step West Coast has been heavily influenced by two-step, but I think the rotational connection, I think the changes of directions, I think the complexity of the patterns um, is something fun. I think West Coast swing dancers who take a stab at two step and get over the whole country thing because I'm in the Country Dance Hall of Fame and I still don't love country music. Some of it's awesome. Do not get me wrong. An awesome song is an awesome song, but like I am naturally not a Kentucky. I, I love Kentucky. That's okay, I'm though. naturally not a country boy, but I love two step. If you don't like country music, we also have an unconventional non country two step list that you can look up, which is super fun. Yeah, if you want to take a stab at two-step, we have an awesome... We actually have some music lists. This is something we're working on. It's pretty fun. Um, we're coming up... Um, Emily's done 99% of the work on music... Okay, 100. <laughs> okay, I put them on the site. I do one... Well, I do 1% of the work. You do. I'll give you um, that. Five. I'll give five, you five. Maybe even five. Hey. I'll give you five. But we're coming up with some um, great music resource lists for a bunch of different popular dances. So, um, obviously, West Coast Swing is out there. Um We've got a two-step list, cha-cha list, nightclub, nightclub waltz. waltz. Uh, East Coast Swing is coming, and it's going to be. We're going to have one big resource, and then we're also going to have different pages for the separate um, dance styles themselves. I know two-step is out there right now. I believe West Coast is. Uh, the other ones are coming soon, but there will be plenty of. Oh, a nightclub. Did I say nightclub? Yeah, nightclub. Nightclub. And it'll in essence be a free resource, just like the um, the ebook. Um, and if you're still watching us, you want to support us. The goal of us, we want to put as many free resources as possible, but still the hub of all of it is the membership at West Coast Swing Online. So if you're a member there, it's 20 bucks a month or 200 bucks a year, which works out to $16.53 a month, billed annually. Um, but it's the members there that really support what we're able to do and let us put more time and effort and resources into stuff like the music list. And now on the back end of the videos, it, we started with West Coast Swing, and there's 400 and some odd West Coast Swing videos, but we now have Two Step and East Coast Swing and Nightclub and Cha Cha and Waltz is coming soon, hopefully next week. So we're going to build out, and it should still stay priced at that same 20 bucks a month. So you're going to get incredible value on the back end. Would you recommend any of the Latin style dances for West Coast Swing? Which is where I thought you would go with it. No. Um, you know, I think if you learn any dance style, you can. You'll find some sort of. You'll thing. find similarities. What was the. Was it Miyoto Masashi? Um, I said what I love. Wait a minute. Can you talk for a second on that? So, the reason I said that is uh, we had a conversation two weeks ago, last week, I don't remember, about a uh, foot strike. Oh, yeah. And uh, making sure on West Coast of being clear with the foot strike, and that happens a lot in Latin dances. Um, so being able to show the clearness of the feet, unlike in a smooth dance where you're progressing through the foot in a lot longer period, of uh, being able to show the striking of the foot and moving through the foot as if, um, it were something more akin to a Latin dance where I thought you were going to go with that actually. 
Gordon, there are tons of country West Coast swing songs. So yes. if you haven't heard one, oh, check out the list because you'll find <laughs> that some of them don't sound country, but they are. So I challenge you to dance West Coast swing to a country song. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the Miyoto Masashi co- quote was, uh, if you know the way broadly, you will see it in all things. Oh. Right. So if you understand a concept somewhere, you'll start to see those concepts in other areas. I remember years ago, I was uh, competing in American Rhythm, in American Style Ballroom, and I took a coach from, at that point, the, uh, our coach was the current uh, national champion, world champion, and we took a lesson. And then the next weekend, I was at a West Coast Swing event, and I brought some of the teachers, and we took a lesson with Mario Rabao so we could work on some teacher training stuff, and it was literally the same lesson that I had as a high-level ballroom competitor. It was the center moving towards and the center moving away. And when you understand the concepts, it's the same everywhere. So to circle back to that Latin um, question, yeah, if you went to a, I, I would recommend like, if you went to like a Latin technique workshop, right? If you're not gonna master cha-cha and rumba and that stuff and you don't, that doesn't float your boat, by going in and going to like kind of a technique workshop where you don't have to dance with people, but you listen to a high-level um um, high level technique from a coach, you'll start to see some things and you'll start to understand some things that you can um, use in your dancing, in your West Coast Wing. Do you want to answer this next yeah, question? You can read okay. One. So, Yan Lee said that they don't know anything about online businesses and was wondering if there is any income from online teaching with how many hours are put into this. Yeah. So, um, I'll give away the secrets. Uh, yeah, my goal is to help as many people as possible for free, right? And that's why we chose as a lot of people, you know, during the lockdown went to charging for their classes. I wanted to help as many people as possible. And my theory is the more people that we help, a small percentage of them will be willing to buy something of ours, right? The t-shirts really were just kind of an add on to our YouTube channel. So if you're on YouTube, you could buy a t-shirt. Um, which is fun. Emily's put a lot of effort into those. And there are new ones up there. So if you like spins, you can be a spin junkie and have a spin junkie shirt. Nice. I think <laughs> Megan's going to buy 12 of those. All sales will come from Megan. Um, 12 different colors. Right? <laughs> but uh, our our online membership site, westcoastswingonline.com, you can get to it through westcoastswingonline.com, countrydanceonline.com, or socialdanceonline.com. But the membership site itself has all the videos. I think it's 500 and 23 as we sit today, but by the time we upload a lot of these live videos that will go on the site, everything that we put out ends up on the membership site. So if you're a member of our site, you have everything that we put out and it is way more than goes on YouTube. In general, I think what goes on YouTube is about 20% max, 10% of what we actually put out. Um, Then we have some courses that we sell. So if you're on our email list, sometimes we launch our courses. Um, We actually have a couple different ones in the works and then we're going to scale. That's what this online teaching thing, I thought it might be a good thing that people would be willing to pay for in the future where we did um, limited number, small type of group classes, which a lot of people have been doing right now during the lockdown. I just didn't want to go the route of charging people where everyone's locked down. I figure let's help people as much as we can while we're locked down. And then later on when everything's flowing, we're back to normal. Um, we have a pretty good format now where we've got good cameras and Ben knows how to, he's done an awesome job behind the camera. We've got a good groove and a flow. We've taught some cool group classes using all four of us. And um, so I feel comfortable now we could come up with some things that we might charge for in the future. But our goal is to ultimately help as many people as possible. There are a few people that are willing to pay us on our membership site and buy our courses. And for those of you guys who do, we love you because you allow us to function as we do and to continue to support people. Um, and thanks to you guys, because we all have worked a lot. <laughs> what's the what's what's the work for free? Is there a fancy Latin way of saying that? What? Fancy Latin I don't know Latin. Yeah, I thought you were smart. I took a year of Latin, but I don't remember any of it. <laughs> for free? For free? <clears throat> all right. Um, that's it uh, as far as we Was have for questions. Was there something about hip hop somewhere? Um, they said hip hop as a cross training dance. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so like individual style. Give me that because I don't know they. Yes, sorry. Um, so one of the questions previously was, are there any crossover dance styles that would help with West Coast Swing? 
Um, and so a few have been thrown out there, but hip hop is absolutely one that can uh, cross over. You can use the different isolations and movements in general uh, to help with all of your own individual styling. So that is definitely one to try if you haven't tried hip hop before. Rance, thank you, man. He said he referred people to our website. I appreciate it. And that's, um, yeah, that's one of the biggest ways. I listen to a podcast for fighting because I like fighting. And they have a commercial that comes in the middle of a podcast. And they always say, one of the best things you can do to support us, like, hey, if you want to give us money, that's great. But if you tell your friends about us, that's a big way. So yeah, by sharing our stuff, um, if anyone goes, I tell people the easiest thing to do, go to the website, enter your email address on the first page. So if you have friends, tell them to do that because they're going to get a free membership with 50 free videos on the site. But probably more important than that is we send out a move of the week. So when everything's normal, um, we technically send it out every two weeks. We've been doing it every week while we're in lockdown. So we can kind of give people something to look forward to, but pretty soon we'll go back to every two weeks. But in that email, we'll send out a move of the week. We've started to include in that move of the week, like an alternative dance. So you get a West coast swing move and then a two-step move or an East Coast swing move or a cha-cha move, um, just like all of our videos on YouTube. Specific stuff that does not go out on YouTube it comes out on the email list. Then we share other cool things, our ebook that we've launched, the music resources. We have some really cool resource pages where we, we literally have hundreds, 400 blog posts on our website um, that don't get a lot of love. So what we'll do is we cobble them together into a musicality resource page and a spins resource page. So we'll link those things up I think this past email, I put out the styling resource page and there's tons of cool stuff on that resource page. There's videos and there's blog posts and there's, so if you're looking for something for your styling, boom, there's a ton of stuff inside of that. Um, <laughs> Carrie. Carrie says, how about a personal defense class, Brian? You could teach us how to fight. Um, yes, I feel reasonably comfortable to defend myself in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. However, Carrie... I am not a black belt in that. If I'm a black belt in dancing and I feel comfortable teaching dancing to just about anyone, I would not be the guy to go to because you live in Louisville, Kentucky. And I would go to Core Combat Sports with my good friend, Rolando Haddad. Um, he is the guy. He's actually taught the governor's um, task force. His, what do they call it? Protection, not secret service. Oh, okay. so secret service. Yeah. Yeah, so those are the guys. God. In Louisville, we've got those, those are the guys. Like, I train with a bunch of police officers, and the people who teach all that stuff over there are like legit the best of the best, really high level pro professional people. So, if I was looking to defend myself, I would not learn it from, you know, intermediate, poor level intermediate dancer Brian. <laughs> I would learn from <laughs> world champion Rolando and the instructors over at Core Combat Sports. Rand said that he started in West Coast two years ago by signing up for West Coast Swing Online when he wasn't placing a novice. Yay! Boom! That's awesome! Are you placing a novice now? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> you should be after lockdown. <laughs> this is going to provide some opportunities for all of us. Those of us who've been practicing will... Yeah, so that's awesome, man. Diane says that it's not going... She appreciates all the videos and it's not going to be the same um without sharing time with us on a near nightly basis Aww. you know what it's, it's it's like our fireside chats are over <laughs> it is true like that's why i said and these guys kind of like i don't know if you officially rolled your eyes at me when i was like we're still gonna do something you know live after we go back to work i thought we were and then i was told we weren't and then you said we were so i was confused <laughs> well we do have to teach lessons in here so that's where? And we've, you know, because we've been locked down, we set all, there's lights. You guys can't see there's lights all around us and there's cameras and there's a table. And so there's a bunch of equipment that's been just set up, which is a pain in the neck to take up and down each night would really, then we'd have 1200 man hours yeah. instead of 800. Um, and even though we had some students come in and um, practice during the lockdown, they can, like, we, they just, uh, they, the we just, they just picked the corner. They two-stepped around our setup here. Um, but yeah, it will be a little weird. That's why I'd like to have some sort of a format moving forward. And I haven't brainstormed what that will look like. Um, no, but I love these. I would never have eye rolled. Yeah, no, it's, it's been super fun. It's been, it's been cool to get to know everybody. It's been fun to interact like this. Um, yes, 
despite the fact that if we put a video out, quite possibly in good times, 20,000 people could see it, but yet we have a small amount of people that we're able to act really uh, interact deeply with and learn a lot about, and it's been super fun. So yeah, I'll, I'll miss it too. I'll be good with a couple nights off. It is getting to the summer solstice. Yeah, we, it's have, my we solstice. have Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday off. Yeah. We're just taking it down. So Rand said that he made it to intermediate after Yay! starting. Hey, he was making finals and intermediate until COVID hit. Oh, darn that. You're on the path. <laughs> um, Yan Lee, if we uh, wanted a little clarification, social dance online, country dance online, are these in addition or how do they relate to West Coast Swing Online? They're all connected in the circle of life. Yeah, so um, Yan asked, we have West Coast Swing Online is like our main thing is what we do, right? But we actually, I, I've danced professionally in all the dance forms, right? So... Um, as especially now with the lockdown, we were, have been working on this for a while. So the second thing to launch was country dance online. And then the third one is social dance online. They're basically, and I'm, you guys have danced for a while, there are uh, prejudices within specific communities, right? So if you happen onto a two-step video of ours and I say, hey, I'm from West Coast Swing Online, you're likely to go, I'm a two-stepper. I don't need no West Coast. I want that a two-step. Wow. Right? <laughs> I got country fast. So, I mean, I'm a legit country dancer. I made it to the Country Dance Hall of Fame. So, the website <laughs> Country Dance Online will speak to the country side of stuff, right? So, on that site will exist resources for country dancers, music lists, and helpful tips. And it already does have a bunch of really helpful Stuff. So if you're a country dancer, head over there, go to the resources tab. Um, it's not as, certainly is not as filled out as West Coast Swing online because it takes time, but there's some helpful resources. And we're going to do the same thing on social dance online for social dancers, right? So we're not targeting like high level competitive ballroom dancers, but there are tons of you guys who dance socially in ballroom and West Coast. And West Coast, there's lots of material out there for social dancers, there's less, there's less so written for um, social dancers in, like, let's say the ballroom world. So if we do two step and East Coast and cha, or two steps country, but East Coast and cha cha and waltz and those types of dances, which a lot of us do socially anyways, and we do it in a way that speaks to us as social dancers. Hey, here's this waltz pattern, but here's how you can handle it, have a cool variation. Here's how you can style up your waltz to not feel like you're boring because you only have five patterns, which is the way we look at West Coast Swing. Um, we're approaching those dances the same way. Now, if you're a member of any one of those sites, you have access to all of our videos. It's one membership. You have everything, right? But if you happened on to... Everything the light touches. Everything the light touches. That's, uh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so if... Uh, you know, if you happen onto a cha-cha video and I said, I'm Brian B. from Country Dance Online, you'd go, I'm not a country dancer, I'm a ballroom dancer. But if I say I'm Brian B. from Social Dance Online, we help social dancers with these really cool resources, go over there, pick up our music resource, they go to Social Dance Online, and they see normal social dance looking people, then they're likely to go, hey, this is my spot. If you're a hardcore country dancer and you go to the website and I'm, you know, holding uh, frame for waltz, it looks really weird. But if I'm standing there in a cowboy hat, you go, oh, I get it. So it's a little bit of a marketing ploy, but really just to connect people to the, to the resources for free. But if you happen to be a member of the site, all the information is free, but we are continuing to build out like music lists. We have one for West Coast Swing. So you can find that, download that for free. Um, two step, we did that next. And now we're working through basically all the ballroom dances. Um, and eventually, any of the music lists you download will include everything. So if you download the Cha Cha music list, you're just going to get the music list for all the dances. Really cool, like the ebook. I'm getting excited about that stuff. It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Rand's is uh, Gordon just have a bit of a conversation going on. But um, overall, that is what we have from conversations, comments, and questions. Boom. So I apologize if we were a little off topic on the good to great thing. Um, but it was a fun chat. Yeah. Super fun chat. Yeah. So uh, check out the email next Tuesday. 
Uh, we'll send out something. We'll have what the live videos will look like in the future. Um, and as always, we have some cool stuff. So who knows if the music list is out, we might share it in the email. So you might that I think I'll be ready by next week. Yeah. Can they check uh, westcoastswingonline.com backslash live to see what the schedule will look like after? Tuesday? Yeah, 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 yeah. If we have westcoastswingonline.com backslash, it's forward slash. Forward it's technically slash. forward slash. Technically, it's a forward slash live. Um, there it is. Poof, backslash forward slash. Ben is trying to figure out if I'm right or wrong. I don't know backslash if I am or not. Is this way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll try to update that as well. But the email will kind of speak to what the live videos will look like. Um, in my perfect world, at some point, we will. Um, That's a forward slash. Bingo. Um, it's in my. It's backwards from the top. It's backslash. In my world. That's a forward slash. Forward from the top. Remember, Whatever. smart people. Swingonline.com. Slash live. <laughs> slash um, live. Yeah, well. You'll find it. We'll try to update that. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I really don't know what the format will look like exactly, but I would like to keep some sort of schedule throughout the quarter of some live videos that can be looked forward to. I agree. Yeah. And the good news is we don't have to work around the landmines otherwise known as dance events for at least a little bit. Yeah. But we do have free time. It's crazy to look at my calendar. I've got a little uh, travel app that has all my travel and like, I would have been teaching at Booking the Bluegrass this weekend. And next weekend, I would have been in Albuquerque. And like, <laughs> it's like, I'm just hanging out. I like it. <laughs> but I would have been in all sorts of crazy places. So, and someone said Calgary 2021. Yes. I'll be back, Calgary 2021. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>